Hi and welcome back. We have our second episode now for a podcast and since it's the new year we thought we might um, show you what we sewed last year. We usually take quite a bit of time to make a project so that yeah we ha don't have that many projects but still we can show you what we did and I think it, it will be enough to fill one episode or so. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and we did also split it up in sewing and knitting because yeah, each section is already quite a bit. So do you want yeah. to start? I start, yes. Okay. So my first uh, project, my first skirt project is a 1900s petticoat. It is based on an original pattern from I think 1902 or something. Mm -hmm. um, Petticoats normally, or those that I have seen, are made of white fabric and they are, they are decorated with white lace. But I wanted to go a bit differently, so I used a yellow fabric combined with white lace. And I really, really like it, especially the bottom part, which just creates this stripy effect, which I think is really cool, especially seen from, from, the, from far. <clears throat> Um, this petticoat is constructed in a way that it's very tight and so tight fitting around the waist and the hips and then it flares out, out at the bottom and this is created by um, having these panels at the bottom which flare out at the hem. So the hem circumference is a bit uh, wider at the bottom than above. Um, the vertical lace so the lace that is running vertically at the bottom of the petticoat is self-made we have made a um, so i have written <laughs> a <laughs> blog post on our website about both the, the sewing and the uh, lace making process of the skirt so about the days that i made myself and how it was it was really a cool experience because it's one of the first projects of mine where i use so much lace just in one piece of clothing. Um, the bottom part of this petticoat uses uh, store-bought lace, so I couldn't do that much lace because I would be sitting here right now, even then, and the petticoat was finished in May last year, so it would have been a lot of work, so I cheated a little bit, but I think it's okay. And we wanted to make that photo shoot in, yeah, in the summer, yeah, yeah, or spring, so sometimes it's it's okay, I think. <laughs> Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's my petticoat. I like it very much. And uh, we went to Konevi Münster, which is uh, near Aachen, uh, which is a beautiful historical village. And we got some very beautiful pictures there. Yeah. That we can insert here too. Yeah. And actually, I made the same or, or used the same pattern for also petticoat. But mine looks really different. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't add that. that much lace. So mine is entirely white. And um, I also added some handmade lace, but uh, it's just this border and it's Armenian needle lace. But yeah, basically we use the same pattern and mm -hmm. still we have quite different mm -hmm. results and I find this Really cool. Within the pattern, there were several options to yeah. yeah. So you could make the bottom half, which just goes beneath the knees, I think, and then you could add several panels at the bottom, or you could just make one whole skirt in one piece. Yeah. Or at least one panel, front panel or back panel, just in one piece. Yeah. So this also gives quite a variation. Yeah, and I actually combined the whole skirt with one. Uh, Volant? Uh, a ruffle? Ruffle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we basically personalized each mm. petticoat. So you added these small ruffles there at the hip, uh, uh, at the uh, knee? At the knee yeah. line. It's, it's above the other longer ruffle um, to hide the for seam line, basically. And for volume. And for volume, of okay. course. Because um, 
if I wear this petticoat underneath, for example, my uh, bird skirt, I will show you next, is um, it really gives this, the whole skirt the volume which I want it to have. Mm. And it starts basically at the knee line because above that it should mm. be quite narrow. Yep. And it's already quite dirty because it mm. I wear it quite often. <laughs> <laughs> have you washed it already? Yeah, twice. And the, the uh, needle lace, what about the needle lace, the crossword wash? Yeah, it works really well. I don't have any problems. I, I wash it uh, in a not so harsh mm. washing program. program. Yeah. So that's quite okay. I mm. just want, went once into quite a dirty um, section of the street, so this you should still see. Mm. But that's why we have those dust droplets. Uh, yeah. You can are made it. to replace mm -hmm. yeah. be yeah. replaced. Yeah. So yeah. That's the I guess it was also my first project of the year. No, the second. Mm -hmm. No, the first, but I didn't work on it for half a year. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> because I didn't want to make this lace. <laughs> But you did already. Okay. I did. I did finally. <laughs> yeah. So my next skirt project is an 1880 skirt, which is part of a 1880s ensemble of a um, yacht club sports costume. So it's based on a fashion plate that depicts two women wearing a uh, yacht. I think I'm pronouncing it right. I don't know. Uh, club costumes. <clears throat> uh, this skirt is black as you see and we have said some some video footage now it has a uh, an asymmetrical front so this is just a piece of silk that was pleated uh, down this silk is used in the bodice of this uh, dress ensemble so it's just to have some continuity here uh, this is a very nice crispy fabric i think it's polyester this is a polyester fabric that i got for very cheap money on a fabric market in the netherlands we are quite often in the netherlands yeah. to buy fabrics because yeah. it's a lot there's a lot of variety and a lot of yeah very nice basic fabrics to find but also quite uh, some extraordinary fabrics yeah. too and you can have so much inspiration in just one place that's yeah. really yeah. if you have those uh, stores in the cities usually at least in germany mm -hmm. they are basically um they are special mm -hmm. specialized on certain things like kilting or modern clothes yeah. and you only get that yeah that's right yeah so if you live like us near the dutch border then it's really a nice way to go shopping for fabrics absolutely yeah so i used i think around four meters of this and this fabric is really heavy so the skirt itself is yeah really really heavy maybe one or two kilograms which is quite a lot for a skirt absolutely <laughs> yeah um i constructed the skirt in a way that the underskirt so the visible underskirt and the draped overskirt are made in one so they are both um attached to the same waistband which reduces um, like the bulk around the waist there are some cartridge pleats in the back which was something i've never done before which was very cool it looks really cool i think and um, the pattern i used was from um, the second volume of patterns of fashion um, yeah that's it i think so to finish the uh, whole outfit what would be missing what have you um uh, i'm still missing the bodice so it's a vest with a blazer on top in this white um, silk fabric that you saw on the skirt too and a um, blazer in a red velvet so i'm still working on this and as i started very early with with this whole project i can't wait for this to be done honestly <laughs> because it's been on my mind for so long and I've had like a phase where I just worked a lot on it. Then I had to stop because of university and because of other things. 
And because I didn't do, or I didn't have much sewing motivation last year. And then I started again. So it's just ups and downs with this project. So, and uh, there are so many other things that I want to try eventually. So I want to finish this first and then start the next one. But it's yeah. a plan for this year. Yes, yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so second project of the year was for me a bump pad so that I have not only the undergarments or yeah the skirt which makes the form but also the bump pad. And I actually wear it quite often because the skirt I only wear, wear skirts anymore. So um so I no pants, you just wear so. Yeah, I have I have, I don't own any pants anymore. I just oh, gave them to the um charity shop. Yes. <laughs> Basically, yes. I, okay, I have sports pants. Yeah, but that's it. And um I realized that I quite often tear off the bottom back mm. of the skirts mm. but with the bump pad underneath not uh, because so. the skirt um hem is hold up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, so it's it's astonishingly an item I wear quite often. Mm -hmm. And it was in the beginning I made it way too big. Mm -hmm. Now it's you can see it slightly it's quite flat again, mm -hmm. but still the effect is enough mm -hmm. to um once make the silhouette nice and on the other hand um really make this effect of lifting up the skirt hem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I added some lace, so because everything needs lace, of course. <laughs> Not everything, but what kind of lace is this? This is a crochet. I used the star pattern and um yeah basically crocheted the form. And then sewed it in. It has not as it hasn't any structure structural purpose, but uh, I think it's quite nice mm. to see it a little bit. I mean I'm almost always the only person who sees it, but mm. where did you have the inspiration? Or where did you take the inspiration from? It was a pattern from 1903 or two, I guess. So I used the pattern <laughs> pattern sketches and reconstructed the whole thing. I think the crochet was another fabric, but for the rest, it's quite similar to mm -hmm. the original idea, at least. I think we have a short of this uh, of the making of this bump head on yeah. YouTube. Yeah, on our yeah. channel. Can you yeah. make it? Shall I continue with um, yeah. any of my skirts? So, the first skirt of the year. I only show you a little piece of it because that's the pattern, and the pattern was the most important to me. I found this fabric on a fabric market in the Netherlands, and I really loved it. It's actually a furnishing fabric. But um, I thought because it's quite heavy and but it's stayed not heavy. heavy. I mean, you washed it now, so it looks a bit more. Yeah, dry. that's right. It was way stiffer be before I washed it, and I mm. tried. I, I wanted to see how it uh, behaves once mm. it is washed, so I did that. And now it's quite soft. I lined it, so it's still stable. Mm. And again, I used the pattern from the nineties. Hundreds. Mm -hmm. I don't remember when exactly. But this is not the same pattern that I used, that we both used for the petticoats. No, it's, it's another. another. Okay, it's another one. Uh, I really don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's been that long ago. <laughs> yeah, and I have looked at so many other skirt patterns since mm -hmm. then. Um, yeah, so. I learned really a lot in this project about how to distribute fabric, uh, excess fabric at the waist. And as you can see, it's already torn. And oh, I, I have to repair it. That's, uh, that's one thing I really learned um, with making clothes for myself. I start mending them. 
Because mm. bought or store bought clothes, I mended them, but only if I could make it with the machine, not by hand. Mm. And it's now I start, yeah. yeah. And now I start to really care for my clothes. That it's, uh, my clothes have a new sentimental value. Yeah. So I start to care more mm. for them than I did before. Mm. Yeah, that was the second skirt of the year. Nice. <laughs> So what's up with your next skirt? <laughs> My next skirt of the year <laughs> is um, an 1890s skirt. We are not working a lot with the 1890s and nationalists at the moment and 1880s too. So this skirt was made from a wool polyester blend that I had for years that I bought for a few euros in a local um, fabric store when they had a sale coming up. Um, this is meant to be a bicycle skirt. So these skirts are typically, I don't know if you can see, quite short. So they go just below the knee. Um, this skirt is based on a commercial pattern from Black Snails pattern. You can link it down below. I don't remember the exact name of the pattern. Um, I really like this pattern because it has a triangle, a sort of triangle shape at the back, which isn't sadly quite prominent with this fabric, but I think it looks really nice and it's just really simple, like a simple skirt with a double flap of buttons in the front. It has one pocket at the side, which is nice too. Pockets are always... All my skirts, except if my petticoat, have pockets. My petticoat has a pocket. I don't use what? it, but it has a pocket. Why do you use it? I don't know what to, to put inside. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen people put bottles of champagne in their pockets. So <laughs> why not? <laughs> okay, <laughs> next time I'm yeah. going with a bottle of champagne in my skirt <laughs> pocket. <laughs> next time we drink champagne, I think. <laughs> okay. We'll see. <laughs> yes. So this is, yeah, this is my um, particular, uh, my skirt. One thing I'd like to add is that I inserted some tarletin mm -hmm. at the bottom. We bought, because here in Germany it's quite difficult to get tarletin. I, th I I don't know, in the United States it seems so simple to get just all the fabrics you want and you need, but here in Germany you Not. just rely a lot on international shops yeah. and shipping and all of this. So we bought a roll of, I don't know, 25 meters of tarlatan. In Spain. <laughs> in Sp from Spain. And the, the tarlatan itself was just as expensive as uh, the shipping costs. So. Yes. <laughs> but we just um, divided the cost between us. So we can both have just enough tarlatan for yeah. the next 20 years or something. Yeah. So I added some tarlatan at the bottom. Um, and at the front panel, because the front panel needs to be a bit stiffer than the rest, because it just sits flat at the front. There are no pleats, so it's just a flat piece of fabric. So I inserted the whole strip of tarlatan here, and yeah, and that's it, what I wanted to It's add. really a skirt, it's not a split skirt, right? It, it really is a skirt, yeah. Yeah. A split skirt would be nice too, but I've seen some examples online of people making those and there are these trousers that I have a front panel too, mm -hmm. which hides um, the trouser part of the skirt. But I think it's quite um, unpractical that way, because in my opinion you don't have at, at mu uh, that much space to move your legs. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But Maybe it would be interesting try. to try it out, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another skirt project. I think it's enough now. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be nice to just make a wardrobe of interchangeable items so that one skirt fits to several brothers' patterns. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 What about you? Okay. Let me the show you last skirt. skirt of the year. <laughs> <laughs> At least for me. It's this uh, quite summery rose flower <laughs> fabric 
again, it's an interior fabric. It's uh, it was meant to be used as a curtain, and I basically was involved in the design process in an internship. So I made the color corrections and all this stuff and the uh, assemblance of the did you patterns? No, stuff? those okay. were bought. Mm -hmm. That's how it's usually done. Um, yeah, quite big companies that one buys the design and reassembles it and changes the colors and I think there are just platforms for textile designers to upload their designs and they are bought by others. Yes, exactly. Correct? Yeah. yeah. There are platforms, there are um, fairs, they yeah. are basically just made to sell patterns and once a company bought it, they will change it. Mm -hmm. and or not always, but mostly they mm. will change it to and adapt to their needs. And that's what I did in this case. And then these patterns are usually printed or woven and then as a sample sent to the designers and to check if the color is correct and then if the whole um, assemblance or vibe it's okay mm -hmm. if the roses are big mm -hmm. enough or too small or all this. Um, that's why they got um, a big piece of this fabric and I was gifted keep it. it. You could keep it. Yep. Yeah, that's good. How um, much meters are that? Uh, it was so. 1 meter 43 by 1 meter 60. <laughs> and yeah. so it was quite uh, restrictive and I have a never knew what to do with it because I didn't want to cut too much into the mm. pattern. And so I thought I'd make a skirt with a minimal seam lines as possible. It has actually two, only two. Yeah. And I thought I would never be able to make a Victorian skirt because they are always so voluminous, but it mm. worked out. And with a petticoat underneath, it really gets this volume. Vol volume. Oh, volume. <laughs> okay. And mm -hmm. yeah. It's also one uh, skirt with a brush braid on the bottom. Where I... did you get that? <laughs> <laughs> From a German store? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I found a German store which. Uh, Sells them. It's for um, the dundle. Oh, okay. So, yeah. But they're really, really expensive. So, yeah. What is it? Kind of. What it, kind of material is it? Is it wool? It is wool. Wool. Yeah. Okay. It's actually wool. Mm. And um, this protects the hem because the first time I wore it, I was in Vienna, and I destroyed the hem basically. Mm. So I had to. Um, lift a little bit of the hem off mm. again and um, sew the braid on so that it's for the mm. future protected. Mm. And what kind of material is this? It's cotton. Okay. Natural. Mm -hmm. So basically, but yeah. it's a satin woven yeah. cotton. Yeah. This, I like the shine of it. Yeah, absolutely. And this is one project where I really only use natural fabrics of materials everything is natural even with the yarn it's uh, the yarn right, yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah not so much with the bird skirt there mm -hmm. i i assume that there's polyester mm -hmm. mixed in within it's also you never, natural know, yeah. you never know when buying fabrics from private markets yeah yeah so but this is really a project which reminds me on making own patterns. I really mm -hmm. want to make my own patterns again because, well, mm -hmm. that's what I learned. What's my uh, whole uh, studies about? You mean textile? Yeah, the design patterns. The, the, you the textile not, design. Not sewing patterns. No. Okay. I was a bit confused. <laughs> <laughs> no, for the sewing yeah. pattern, yeah. I'm still about learning and reusing what I get and make it the best fitting to my body. Mm -hmm. But um, for the textile design mm. pattern, I really want to do something with uh, no, my own made pattern mm. once again and see if I can print it somewhere. But that's not that easy if you are not a company with a lot of mm. 
meters you're printing if you only want two meters printed mm. of fabric it gets really really expensive i mean there are online platforms where you can just upload your um, your print design and then buy fabrics different kinds of fabrics but this is really expensive it starts with um i think 20 euros per meter just for a basic cotton and, and then you really have to have a good fitting garment yeah. before you print it i think right because then you can also buy silk or something mm -hmm. and yeah. not just print a cotton yeah yeah so maybe that's a project for the next year but mm. no skirts for next year <laughs> It would also be interesting to explore historical textile design. Absolutely. What, because this is a modern pattern, but yeah. um, just to look up what historical patterns are made of, what is typical for the 1890s or 1900s. Yeah. This would be really cool. Do you remember the one uh, outfit you sent me with the big orange? Yes. I would never... We, we can put a link down below. But I would never have thought that this would be an original uh, 19, yeah, 1890s dress because yeah. it looks so modern and so vibrant. Yeah, so yeah. maybe making something like that. Yeah. And there was also in this time really the, the um, orientalism with yeah. really yeah. bold patterns. Yeah. And I'm not sure if I want to remake something like that, but maybe taking the mm. vibrance of it yeah. or the boldness, the big, big forms or yeah, really try with that. But I have... really like colors. So. Oh, I love colors. Yeah, I'm a color, <laughs> color girl. <laughs> I still have to figure out what colors. <laughs> I mm. haven't done that yet. <laughs> but um, there are so many colors available. Yeah. And usually, I that's that's kind of strange. Usually, I wear wear bleh. I wear black or dark green mm -hmm. and gray. But since I'm starting to make my own clothes, I get to get wear blue or green. Baby or blue. Yeah. Purple. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's and more of a of... pink. Yeah. And now I have to go on and make some bodices and they are closer to my face. So I'm a, bit, mm. a little bit scared how to choose colors. It will be fine, <laughs> I think. <laughs> <laughs> but that's also a thing I'm always thinking about. Um, when you make something yourself, you want to really be it um, fitting to yourself, yeah. basically, so that the color fits and everything. Mm. You can't test it before. You, you, well, you can't in the store take it, the fabric and lay it on your skin and see if mm. it matches or not, but you don't see it on your face. Mm. And if you will start... Uh, buy something in the store, you can fit it and see, oh, this yeah. color doesn't work with my skin tone. Yeah. I think it's experience. Yeah, at absolutely. One point. I mean, we could just go to a store, just put on uh, tons of clothes that you would never wear otherwise. And just, <laughs> I mean, store light is different to natural light. Absolutely. And to this light in here, in this room. So this could be a problem, but otherwise, yeah, this would, I mean, it's just experience at the end. Yeah. Okay, so our next section is work in progress and I have a blouse in progress. So I thought I have many skirts now, so I need something to wear with them. And I made a blouse. It's a flannel blouse. Um, it's quite warm really really warm to wear and it's perfect for those this weather right now and it's made uh, based on a pattern from 1906 oh. <laughs> i guess <laughs> it's uh we'll check that later. yeah it's made um it's from the magazine la mode illustre mm -hmm. and i which means illustrated fashions in english yeah and I found this uh, magazine online and basically scoured it for every pattern I can use. <laughs> and this uh, flannel blouse was one of it. It's actually a blouse for children or teenagers, oh, okay. but I really liked the pattern and it was simple. 
<laughs> and not so simple. No. I've never seen this before. You haven't shot me. Ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was basically not so simple because I had to adapt it to my body. And since I have quite a pronounced bust line, I had to make add a dart and change the entire um, upper bodice. But I think it's quite okay for my very first blouse. Mm -hmm. And now the only thing missing are the buttons. I will hopefully do this tomorrow. And then it would be a finished project. That's very cool. And I started on the 30th of December and maybe will end it on the 30th of yeah, January. Nice. So one month. That's a very fast project. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Why did you add this lace here? In the... um, um, that's actually, I bought a book from 1903, I guess. It's uh, called Ich kann schneidern in German. So I can tailor. Yeah, I guess in yeah. English, and it describes every step of the sewing process of any garment you want to make. And for the blouse, it was uh, said that good blouses and approximately five centimeter above the actual hem, and the lining will be finished with some lace. And that's what I did. Okay, I no. haven't seen any. Actual garment for which from the time which does that, but, but you rarely see the insides of garments. Yeah, that's there. true. That's true. So we never know. And so I guess I will just make it like it is described. Um, I basically did everything as described in the book. I maybe I messed up with the cuffs, but <laughs> the cuffs I will make better the next time. I love these pleats right here at the cuff. Yeah, These, they look nice. They were really difficult to make because now the seam line turns a little bit up to the arm because of ah, that. Yeah. And maybe this is something I have to um, yeah, make better the next time to learn from this one. But I think for the first blouse, it's a really warm winter blouse. Mm -hmm. I will probably wear quite a lot. And learn from it to make the next one better. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, that's my work in progress. So what's your work in progress? So my work in progress is... Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, the bodice that is part of the skirt that I showed you earlier. This vest is made of the silk fabric that, I, that you also saw in the skirt. Um, this has been a long journey. <laughs> so first, I wanted to make a vest that is separate from the blazer because I wanted to have a vest that I could use for other outfits as well. But then I realized that the blazer above doesn't ha wouldn't have um, a possibility to stick to the vest. So the blazer, the blazer is really fitted and needs to be really tight around the bust because then when it just moves slightly, then it creates a lot of wrinkles that I didn't want. So the blazer needs to be fixed to the vest. So then I didn't want to destroy the silk fabric because when you sew on silk and you just reopen the seams, then the silk fabric is almost destroyed because you really see the seam lines. So I made with some leftover fabric a new vest that is now seeing that is now being presented here. This vest is attached to the blazer. So there are two layers here, the vest and the blazer, but on the back side, there's only the red fabric, the velvet fabric for um, the blazer. So the vest is attached to the shoulder seams and the side seams. So you yeah, only have the appearance of a vest, but in reality, it's just one piece of clothing. Um, it really, it also needs to have some sleeves, so there's still a lot of work to fit those sleeves. And um, yeah, I still need to attach some ribbon here. As you can see here, I added some um, linen. I think it's linen ribbon to cover the seams. Yeah, I think that's it. I um, used a pattern from, oh, what is it called? From the Keystone 
Guy. Guy. Pattern making. Something <laughs> like this. They're all called the same. I don't really remember. But it's just a basic uh, vest pattern that I used for the vest. And then I changed this pattern slightly to fit to this flavor. So they're, in general, they're the same pattern. Yeah, and for the um, sleeve, I also used a pattern, a sleeve pattern from this book, but it still needs some adjustments because it looks really sad. <laughs> the way it's presented here, it needs a bit of puff, I think. Yeah. A little yeah. bit of ruffles and maybe also a pad. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> the work in progress. Yeah. Maybe they will take a year again. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't say that. No. I plan on finishing this at least at the end of spring. So then we can make a photo shooting at the lake yeah. in the yeah. summer. That would Perfect. be the plan. Yeah. I'm really excited to wear this because. The whole ensemble is just, bustles are really cool and yeah, I'm excited. But I need to <laughs> to uh, step over this, um, how do you say, hindernis. To take this obstacle? Yeah. Yes, I need to take this obstacle and just get it done. <laughs> you might remember that we said that we wanted to make this podcast not only about us, but about other people too. So. Um, As our first guest of this textile podcast, we'd like to present Özge, who is a fellow customer from Turkey. And she's talking about uh, her projects, what inspires her, and about her world that she creates, she's creating with um, historical costumes. I'm really, really happy that she agreed to be part of this pro uh, podcast. And yeah. yeah, we just saw her video and... It's really inspiring what yeah. she has to tell. She seems to be a very kind person. Yeah. yeah. And a really interesting collection of antique garments from Turkey, also from the Ottoman yeah. Empire. So yeah, it's really worth yeah. a watch, I guess. So then it's time for us to say goodbye. Maybe you can make yourself a nice cup of tea, lean back and watch a video. And for us, uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Hello everyone, I am Özge from Izmir, Turkey. I am 24 years old and I am a graphic designer by trade. My passion is all things about sewing and historical clothing in general. I started my sewing journey and found my passion in 2020. And I know most of us can relate. In 2020, everything stopped with the pandemic and everyone searched new things to do. Everyone got new hobbies. So how I got into sewing, it's an interesting story. When the pandemic started, I was still going to university. I was still studying at art school. And suddenly everything got cancelled and the classes cancelled. So I went back to my hometown. Even before I started sewing or doing any costuming, I would always follow costumers and I would admire their work. I would say, maybe one day I can do it too. But I couldn't get to that because of school and other responsibilities. So when everything got cancelled during the pandemic, I actually had a lot of time. I would see the historical clothes on the internet, from the museums or the projects of fellow customers. And I wanted to wear those dresses too. My main reason for sewing was actually because I wanted to wear those dresses. And I never even thought that I would enjoy sewing because I just wasn't interested in sewing or fashion before that. My mother also sews. And I would ask her to sew the dresses for me. 
but she never had the time or she it was just wasn't her interest so I thought maybe I can do it and I asked my mother to buy me a sewing machine at first she thought that I wouldn't enjoy it and that I would get bored very quickly she got the machine that she had wanted at the time she thought that I wouldn't use it anyways but that didn't happen that way <laughs> I really got into it and the whole process I realized that I liked even threading the needle you know so she didn't get her machine back and I started really enjoying the whole process I started at first with modern clothes and then I went to making um, historical clothes I was a little bit scared at first because historical techniques differ a lot from modern sewing and I wasn't sure that I could do that because you need to research and learn those techniques from period books or by studying antique clothing um, or by the costumers who share their knowledge so my only option was to see what other costumers do when it comes to historical techniques because there are no sources or resources when it comes to learning about those things in Turkey I would need to import books from other countries and I just couldn't do that at that time because it costs a lot with the shipping and the taxes so I knew my disadvantages Oh, when it comes to materials, it was the same thing. You need to import a lot of the materials from Europe or from the United States because in Turkey, they just don't exist. So I knew my disadvantage and it scared me. <laughs> I wasn't sure I was going to be able to continue or create the things I wanted to create. But I said, you know what, let's try it. Maybe things will work out and I can do what I want to do. So I started making my first item of historical clothing, which was a 1900s combination, a pair of combinations. And when I shared it on the social media, people actually liked it. I think it was a motivation for me too. I loved the process and I loved wearing it, that whole feeling of it. But people liking it was also one of my motivations to really enjoy it, to continue doing it. I like to sew things that challenge me. I like the learning process. I enjoy it a lot, maybe even more than sewing itself or wearing the clothing. I really, really enjoy learning about how they did things back then, what kind of beauty standards there were, what kind of styles, how they evolved uh, through the seasons in a decade, for example. I like all of these things. I like to research those things and base my designs on a lot of historical facts. I don't care about a 100% historical accuracy, but I do strive for making it look and feel as historical as possible. So with the materials, I try to use a lot of natural materials, natural fibers. I try to imitate the look of the garments from a particular fashion era simply because I feel the most satisfaction 
when they look like original garments. And it's a personal thing for me. Other than that, I really, really enjoy the feeling when I wear those garments on my skin and I suddenly feel like I have time traveled. There's just something about it. It all comes together to create a certain feeling. And I really, really like this feeling. It's this whole thing about feeling like I am in a certain time period when I wear a clothing. It really excites me. I also love when people combine their own artistic vision with the idea of historical clothing. So they don't do it a hundred percent accurately or they don't care about it but they pick up the ideas from the historical clothing and they create their own unique art being inspired by historical clothing and I think it's really cool when it's done right. There are some people like that on the internet that I follow and I am really amazed by their work. Currently, I am sewing mostly Edwardian garments, the 1900s. I stitch both by machine and by hand, depending on which part of the clothing I am at. For example, I machine sew the main seams mostly, but hand finish the clothing, hand finish the seams. I use French seams a lot because I can do them all by machine and it's fast but it's still accurate for certain eras that I'm going for. So I use them a lot. I always gather the clothing by hand and I like to stroke them, stroke the gathers. I think it looks really good. And one tip I can give is pressing the gathers after you have sewn them in place. I don't know why, but it gives a very authentic and neat appearance. Edwardian era is probably my favorite era, um, starting from the 1900s and to the late teens. When it comes to the 1900s, I like the very feminine and freely look all of the fabric the lace and that silhouette i really like but when it comes to the late edwardian period or post edwardian that time period i really like the weirdness <laughs> there are very weird designs and i like the quirkiness of them so they look out of the ordinary and there is a lot of variation in styles in that time period. So I like it. I like the color contrasts. They like to do that a lot. And the weird silhouettes with the hoops and stuff. I really like that. I look at the fashion plates of late teens, 19 teens. And I want to sew them all. All of them. I also like the pastoral look from the 18th century. You know, with the space on the outside. And like the paintings um, where girls carry buckets with their bare feet. And wearing nothing but a shift, a skirt and a pair of stays. And... All of this combined with natural elements, like the background being the nature. I like that aesthetic a lot. Something about it gives a very romantic and a fairy tale vibe, you know? So I can say that I like 18th century working women's clothing as well. I love all fashion eras, but my least favorite one will be the 17th century, 
with the ruffs and all. Visually, it just doesn't appeal to me. But the thing about historical costuming is you tend to come to like eras that you didn't like before. You eventually like them. It's like an acquired taste when it comes to those eras. I know I said I liked working women's clothing from the 18th century, but actually my dream project is a very extravagant silk robe a la Frances. I don't care how ridiculous it might look in the end. I want all the trims and all the frills and all the fancy stuff and someday I want to make it. I also want to make a pair of fancy silk stays to go under it. I also want to get into metallic embroidery someday in the future. I think about how it would be silver embroidered court gown, for example. It would be painfully slow, but really amazing. I hope to do that in the future too. When it comes to what inspires me the most, I can say that antique clothing inspire me the most. Also the illustrations from that particular time period that I am going for. Other costumers also inspire me a lot. When I see other costumers make very beautiful things in their own style and in their own methods, I feel really excited and I feel really inspired to add my own designs to the field. And I like seeing different people creating different garments, sometimes based on a certain pattern, but they all turn out to be different and unique pieces. I think it's amazing. There are also particular people that I am very much inspired by and one of them is Dear Elizabeth of the Boudoir Key and Lauren Rossi of Virtuous Courtism. I can see that they have a lot of dedication a lot of talent and a lot of passion. Aside from sewing, I have also started to collect antique pieces and I have a small modest collection. Mostly I collect antique lingerie and antique lace, also vintage lace, vintage nightgowns and slip dresses. I usually get the items that are a good deal. In Europe, there seems to be a lot of good flea markets. But that's not the case in Turkey. There are a few good ones, but antique clothing in general, in good condition, is hard to find here. Because most people did not dress in European styles back in the Ottoman era. They wore local clothes, local styles, and they are much different than European fashions. Unfortunately, they are often exported outside Turkey, and this makes me so sad. Because then there isn't any Ottoman clothes that we can find in here. But there is nothing I can personally do about it. I am lucky to have some Ottoman pieces in my own collection. One of them is not strange but um, unique. It is called Shalvar in Turkey and people call it bloomers or harem pants outside of Turkey. It is made out of an elmasiye fabric which is a silk fabric specific to the Ottoman period. Uh, while the fashion fabric is really beautiful and delicate with vibrant colors, 
the lining is actually made out of a fabric that was used as a sack like for a potato sack or flour sack and the interesting thing is you can see on the lining piece a stamp of a factory it wasn't that uncommon actually it was common practice to use fabric out of sacks for the lining in clothes i have another piece a silk jacket that i guess it was from the 19 teens the company's stamp actually bled through the fabric because it probably got wet one of the things that i like the most about antique clothing is those kinds of mysteries and they are in small details but when you look closely it gives a lot of information i also like to reference to antique garments when i am about to sew something from that time period i have an antique petticoat from the edwardian era i recently made this petticoat there is a yoke piece at the top and there is the back closure with a placket i wasn't sure how i was going to make it but when i studied that petticoat everything became clear so this petticoat has two set of ruffles and embroidered lace and pin tucks it was very very time consuming but i enjoyed it regardless so that's what i have been up to recently i have started on a new project it's a 1907-ish combinations and i am looking forward to finishing it if you are curious about my work and what i do or if you just want to say hi you can find me on instagram at ozgenaz arslan and there will probably be a link for it down in the description if there is any advice that i can give to fellow costumers or people who want to start sewing i would say that really don't be scared of anything your feelings are valid but they don't mean the truth you don't know how much you will like something until you have tried it so don't be intimidated by trying new things you might realize that you really really enjoy it and that you are successful in it but also i would suggest don't dive headfirst when you want to start a new thing or sew a new project do your research maybe talk to people ask them about how they did it what techniques they used it can be really helpful to ask help from other people and please make samples or practice with mock-ups first practice your stitching practice your tension and things like that when you have never done something before or when you are just starting out if you dive headfirst and don't do any mock-ups don't practice or research enough you can end up losing your materials maybe it was a fabric that was a coupon fabric and now you can't find that fabric anymore or maybe you end up hating the project and telling yourself that you are not talented or you are not successful this is not true everything can be improved by practice and this is especially true with corset making or any other area that you feel challenged by or that you are not experienced in if you are an experienced maker you won't have a lot of issues anyways and you 
already know the importance of mockups and things like that. So that will be my advice to anyone who wants to make beautiful garments or anyone who wants to try their hand at historical clothing. Thank you so much for listening.